Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about The Ice War by Anders Blixt. Um, so this is a diesel punk novel. Uh, if you don't know what diesel punk is, that's okay. It's a comparatively obscure genre. Um, it's an offshoot of steampunk that's set between about 1910, the beginning of World War I era, and maybe 1950 or so. So this primarily takes place, uh, this genre is primarily focused World War I, the 20s and Great Depression, and World War II. Uh, you might think about things like uh, Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow, The Rocketeer, Iron Skies, things like this. These may be more familiar examples. But The Ice War is a kind of interesting, fun, diesel punk spy novel. Um, it's set in a version of Antarctica that's been sort of divided up between uh, several empires. And the empires in this novel don't necessarily correspond exactly to historical empires, but some of them seem to be fairly, uh, fairly similar. So <clears throat> Russia is a big player. The Kingdom of Denmark and Norway is a big player. Um, the Habsburg Empire, which is sort of Austro-Hungarian type empire, is a big player. Uh, England, interestingly enough, seems to be relatively minor. The Empire of Japan is a big player, but they don't, at the beginning of the novel, they don't actually have any interests in Antarctica. Um, so the novel follows the adventures of Johnny Bornwald and Linda Connor. So Bornwald is a, he's a Swedish aristocrat who, uh, because of the Russian invasion and conquest of Sweden uh, and their brutality there, has become a, me a member slash ideological fellow traveler of the Republican rebellions against tyrannical empires. Um, so he works for the Nobel Institute, which is, I, I think it's situated somewhere in Germany, but I don't remember exactly. Um, and basically he goes to Antarctica to try and figure out what scientific, technological, and mineralogical discoveries the Russians have been making. Linda Connor is a working class mechanic um, f who's actually from Antarctica. She's not a native of Antarctica because the natives in this in this are these sort of giant hairy uh, sort of Sasquatch type creatures uh, who have human level intelligence um, and also these giant leviathans which are huge like whale things that like I don't know live on land and basically they're just giant like mountainous creatures um, anyway, not central enough that I'm going to be talking about them particularly. Um, so Bornwald and Connor go to this Russian mine, which gets attacked by uh, the forces of Juliusburg, which I think is some version of like a South African empire, like a the Orange Free State of the Boer Republics, but I'm not 100, it's not 100% clear. Brix, uh, Blix doesn't necessarily give us a massively clear depiction of this world, and we don't really need it necessarily to appreciate the action of the story. But basically, they go to this Russian mine, it gets attacked, they escape with some valuable mineral resources that are sort of evidence of what Russia has discovered. Um, then they get sort of captured slash conscripted into the Russian military uh, where they find out that the Russians have advanced basically atom powered or atomic powered uh, tools like uh, heaters and a trans uranium bomb. Then the Japanese start attacking everyone, mostly the Russians. Um, but they later sort of attack the Danish Empire, which is what Bornwald and Connor are really sort of allied with at the at that particular moment. <clears throat> so they managed to steal the transuranium bomb, 
and they're taking it back to Friedrichsborg, which is the Danish, one of the Danish cities, port cities, where uh, Bornwald's cloud ship is making repairs. And the cloud ship is going to take it back to the Nobel Institute for study. Because the Japanese, who are these sort of feared and vicious World War II style um, fighters, have taken over one of the Danish cities in, in addition to having basically destroyed Russian interests in Antarctica, Bornwald decides that he needs to use the transuranium bomb and blow up basically the entire Japanese force. So he basically commits a sort of genocidal war crime uh, at the end of the novel. So that's the plot summary. There's two things that I think that I find really striking about this novel, things that I think are really interesting. One is that Bornwald and Connor are together pretty much the entire novel. They regularly sleep in the same room. They go through all the same adventures. They kill people together. They have uh, life-threatening escapes together. They foil plots together, etc., etc. There's virtually no indication that they have any sort of romantic interest in one, one another whatsoever. Now, that's not necessarily a problem. I actually really like that. I, 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 I appreciate that because I think the reason I find it so striking is a sort of Hollywoodization of my horizon of expectations. I mean, you think about any movie today, any, any film being made by Hollywood or even most independent films, things like this, if you have a male and a female character, you're going to have a love story between them. They're going to have some sort of romantic interest. Here we don't have that, and it's really kind of refreshing to not have that be an aspect of it. Like, the story is just two comrades who happen to be male and female having these adventures, saving one another's lives, supporting one another, fighting for their cause, etc., etc. And it's, again, it's, it's striking by its absence, but I think it's striking by its absence more because we're, we slash I are culturally trained to expect that romance. So it's really interesting that it's not here. The closest we get is almost at the very end when Bornwald is leaving on his... They, they put together a plane basically out of spare parts and he's leaving to drop the transuranium bomb on the Japanese. Um, he's like, Linda looked surprisingly feminine even though she's in grease covered overalls and has a crew cut etc etc but other than that there's nothing and it's really I, I i appreciate it so two thumbs up for not putting a love story in this thing that didn't need a love story for what it is the other thing that strikes me though uh i'm less on the fence about and that's a kind of subtle anti-japanese racism in the vein of what you get in like World War II, 1950s, even 1960s anti-Japanese propaganda, um, or like depictions of Japanese of the Japanese in in World War II movies made in the 50s, 60s, even into the 70s, um, like Bridge on the River Kwai, for instance. This sort of brutal viciousness. Um, and, I mean, during World War II, a lot of propaganda suggested that the Japanese were not fully human in some way. And we get some of that same sort of prejudice in this novel. Things like... Conceptualizing the Japanese as vicious killers, as as sort of brutal slaughterers, etc., etc., who are going to rape women and commit other sort of war crimes. 
Now, obviously, this is true to a certain extent. I mean, during World War II, the Japanese Imperial Army did some incredibly horrendous things. But at the same time, so did many of the other armies in World War II. And we rarely saw that sort of dehumanization permeate the popular consciousness um, of Western nations, especially in the U.S., in the way that anti-Japanese racism did. So, I mean, sure, the Germans were presented as vicious, they were presented as barbaric, but they weren't necessarily presented as subhuman in the way that the Japanese were. And so it's incredibly problematic that we get some of those same sentiments in this novel. But the other angle on that, the other sort of caveat with that, with that critique is that I think this is an issue of diesel punk as an, as a genre because it's set in the 1920s, thirties and forties. You have a lot of those attitudes from the time that then sort of get reflected into diesel punk fiction movies etc etc so the analogy that i would make and I, I recently argued this in a in a paper i just published um i'll put a link to that down in the description in case anybody's interested but with steampunk set in the victorian era the 19th century even though steampunk is often ostensibly progressive, socially progressive, a lot of times it subtly or not so subtly reinforces Victorian gender binaries or gender hierarchies. And this is one of the challenges of neo-Victorian literature, steampunk literature, film, etc., etc., is how do you navigate between an original cultural context that is extremely patriarchal and has a very defined distinction between men and women and their social roles and contemporary attitudes and values that are more inclined to challenge that patriarchal distinction, even though we still live in deeply patriarchal societies. I think we have the same kind of thing in diesel punk as a potential problem, uh, particularly diesel punk set in World War II, set in, or that engages with um, the Eastern theater, the war in East Asia. How do you balance, on the one hand, a society that was deeply, deeply racist, that was full of anti-Japanese racism with contemporary rejections of racism. And I, I'm not sure that Blixt has really done a successful job in this case.